Hello there and welcome to Bruxelles Je T'aime, your news weekly talk show about European affairs. On Brussels, my love, we take a look at some stories that hit the headlines of late. We find out what's at stake for you and for Europe. I'm Maeve McMahon, thanks for joining us. Coming up this week, an EU medicine plan to address shortages and accessibility issues was finally put on the table last Wednesday. The brand new rules for the pharma industry will now be discussed by EU member states. With so much at stake for patients, industry and the healthcare sector, we're zooming in on the small print and asking if it's really what the doctor ordered. And artificial intelligence. Some are petrified and some static. One thing is clear, it needs regulation. This week, MEPs postponed a debate and a vote on stricter rules for apps like Chat GPT. So we're asking what's up and checking why important votes and technology keep getting kicked down the road. Raising the question, is the EU just not able to keep up with AI? To talk about these stories and much, much more, we're joined here in our studio by Vlad Gheorghe, Romanian MEP with Renew Europe. Hello, thank you for having me. Great to see you. Danielle Brady, Health Policy Analyst at the European Policy Centre. Thank you, great to be here. And Adrian van den Hoffen, Director General of Medicines for Europe. Thank you for having me. Great to have you all, lovely to see you. Now, before we, before we hear your insights, let's just get up to speed on what exactly the EU Commission put on the table this week and why. Christopher Pitcher's reports. <laughs> After huge delays, the much-anticipated reform to the EU's pharmaceutical rules was presented this week in Brussels. The controversial file that aims to address the affordability of medicines and access to them is the biggest revamp to Europe's medicines regime in 20 years. Closely watched by EU capitals, the pharma industry and consumer organisations, we asked the European Commission how bitter the pill could be to swallow for the EU's pharmaceutical sector. As always, the European Commission is playing a difficult balancing act. Make sure Europe's sick can easily access the medicines they need, while also keeping a valuable multi-trillion euro sector competitive. This is a balanced proposal. Um, it's about patients, it's about making sure that you and I have access to the medicines that we need. And at the same time, we need to have an, uh, an industry that is available, that is ready to actually deliver and develop these medicines. And so I think it's a package that is there for us people. It's also there for the industry to make sure that we are all uh, having the medicines that we need. Question now, is it a fair prescription for the EU? So that is the question of the week. Is it a fair prescription? Um, Danielle Brady, I'd like to start with you. If you just give us a bit of insight on what exactly is in this proposal and what how it will impact our viewers. Yeah, so I think in terms of is it a fair prescription, I think the Commission have tried their best to make it as fair as, as they can. As was mentioned in the clip there, definitely not an easy task and it was a balancing act. What the main aims of it is to increase um, affordability, accessibility and availability to EU citizens across the member states um, and to reduce health inequalities. One thing we see is that depending on where you live in the European Union, it can really depend on your access and whether or not you have access to certain med medications, which of course is massive for citizens. Um, so this is what this... Uh, package tries to do in, in one sense. Um, it tries to uh, incentivise pharmaceutical companies also to launch in EU 27 EU member states um, at the one time um, in terms of it talks about market exclusivity and giving them extra time um, to remain the sole competitor in that while also um, reducing it in another way um, overall if, if it's not across, across member states. So for citizens and for patients what we hope with this uh, package is that it will increase um, access um, and affordability and the patients get the medicines that they need um, okay. in quicker time. And we heard as well from the EU Health Commissioner today or this week when she was presenting that proposal she said where you live should not determine uh, whether you live or whether you die. Uh, Vlad, what's your reaction and the MEPs in your party reaction to this proposal? Well, some data for you exactly on this topic. If you live in Romania, my home country, or in Bulgaria, or in Poland, your access to new important medicine is, on an average, around 800 days after they are uh, approved. If you live in Germany, your, same ch your chances are around 133 days after the medicine is approved. So, that's first uh, a, mo a very important topic. Second, this is an argument that we need something like this because we're all European citizens and we need availability all over the EU, in all over, over all its corners. So yeah, definitely this is a very, very important proposal and this is data that shows us why. 
Adrian, will uh, this r reform pre presentation, will it address this issue that Rad has outlined there? Well, certainly there will be some steps to improve the situation. I think during COVID-19, everybody understood that this inequity of access to medicines, as Vlad was pointing out, is not fair and it needs to be solved. And that's why the EU intervened in the purchase and distribution of COVID vaccines to make sure everybody in Europe would have a fair access. And I think that was the right thing to do. And now this legislation, it's a little bit more difficult because we're talking about the normal medicines that people would take if they're ill or if they have different diseases. And that's much more national. But there are some, some concrete measures in there. So uh, certainly um, for new medicines, if they are not launched in all EU markets, they will receive a reduced incentive. If they launch in all markets, they will receive a higher incentive, so a higher reward, if you wish. That will motivate them to make deals because I think one of the big problems is a country like Romania cannot afford the same price as a country, say, like Germany or France. So there has to be some balancing there. And at the end of the day, this is all about people. It's all about patients across Europe who, as we said, are struggling to get their hands on medicines that they really need. And um, to hear how health representatives here in Brussels have been reacting to the proposal. Our Louise Albertus spoke to Rare Disease Europe and European Patients Forum. Take a listen. If Europe doesn't come together as a real single market, able to negotiate and to bargain on the volume of patients over several years, we are simply weak and we will go nowhere and continue to lose the ground. So the regulation is good, going in the right direction, but it needs companions to succeed. Member states have an obligation to look after their citizens, uh, and so we cannot afford to lower expectations, no. So hands of court, or the, this is all in the playing in the courts of the EU member states here now as well. I mean, I expect we'll see heated discussions, um, Vlad, among EU member states as they try and get this over the line. Well, I would hope that everything is on the same page here because as we heard from the experts it's about our citizens and we as politicians and f the pharma uh, companies are working actually for the same people for the citizens because if uh, there there is no pharma company without its clients you know the patients and we, we need to remember that we remember that i think they know that and so this is why i think we can reach this conclusion that we need to have availability has two two parts price very very important and also access and we need to combine the two we 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 need to remember that but when will we see this become a reality uh, danielle there's obviously elections taking place uh, next may then we see a new commission appointed that will take a lot of time will eu capitals be able to agree on this before then of course they'll have to discuss it with the co legislator the european parliament it's looking very unlikely that it will actually be through by the end of this political cycle, as you mentioned, the elections in the Parliament next year. And also then we have elections um, in various member states in the Council. So it's also difficult to predict what the makeup of the Parliament might be when it gets to these negotiations, what the makeup of the Council might be. So in determining what those negotiations might actually look like, what the wants and asks might be, it's also difficult to determine. Um, and it's, it's a slight pity that it's come so late in the legislative cycle that we're only seeing it now. Of course, it was subject to delays. Um, so, yeah, I think it's Why going to be a great challenge. Adrian? Well, I think the adjustment to the incentive system uh, raised a lot of controversy with not my industry, but with the big pharma industry. Um, and consequently, this kind of change is, is quite controversial. When you talk about looking at intellectual property or incentives, mm -hmm. There's always a lot of sensitivity around that, and I think the Commission obviously came under a lot of uh, political pressure as a result of that. That's why it was delayed quite And meanwhile, clearly. patients waiting at home. Describe what's the situation in your region like for, for people's access to... Well, to as I said, it, it's not good. It's definitely not good. And we had the pandemic as an example, but also after the pandemic, what happened last year when we had a lot of types of flus... Uh, all over one over each other and we had problems in my home country we had huge problems with medicine for children imagine that that you never want to hear something like that so this is a very important issue i think this should be one of the main topics in the next elections european elections if you ask me and i think this should be an incentive for people here 
to get the job done before we get to vote for uh, for the European elections because we need to show the people what have we been doing. If we postpone it, I think it's uh, it's a definite failure for all of us here in Brussels. And according to the European Consumer Organization, who've been following carefully as well this pharma uh, package, the situation regarding access is alarming across the European Union. They dug out the figures in countries like Portugal, Spain, Italy and Belgium. You can take a look there on your screens and and a lot of people could not access their medicines at least once in the last two years in Portugal, Spain, Italy, Belgium. The figure is pretty astounding. And we're talking about medication like for, for, for illnesses like depression, like asthma. They need their meds. And according to the EMA as well, there was a massive antibiotic shortage across Europe all winter. I mean, what, are you, what can you do to, to address that issue? Yeah, certainly. So as Vlad was pointing out, there was a massive surge in infections, particularly in children for a variety of different reasons. So the surge was a 300 to 500 percent increase compared to the year before. So obviously when you're producing medicines, you're not producing one year, let's say 100 percent, the next year 500 percent. I mean, that's not something that's easy to plan for. So one of the things I think that is actually missing in the legislation is can we work together to better predict and prevent these kind of surge related shortages. We had them also during COVID for ICU medicines where the increase was 900%. Okay, so the industry had to obtain special exemptions from competition law to produce that quickly, uh, and special exemptions from, from a lot of regulations because otherwise it would have been impossible. With the, the antibiotics, it was a little bit the same. There's another problem with the antibiotics, which is the production of the cons is so consolidated in very few factories today there is some production in, in Romania, actually, but most of the production in Europe is in Austria and Italy. Um, and it's so consolidated because these older antibiotics are really subject to pricing policies which make them too cheap. To give you an example, this antibiotic we're referring to here, the manufacturing price is around two euros, okay, in France. That's less than what you would pay for a cup of coffee. And to sustain this very complex antibiotic manufacturing, which is uh, highly highly complex to produce, uh, this is not really sustainable. It's driving to too much consolidation. What would your reaction be to that? I completely agree. Um, and it's an issue as well in terms of antimicrobial resistance, which is a massive problem that the EU is facing at the moment. And beyond the EU, in fact, it's known as the silent pandemic um, at the moment. The legislation attempts to address that and it's probably going to be perhaps one of the most contentious issues when we come to negotiation um, big pharmaceutical um, industry is not content to put it mildly perhaps um, with this so we'll see also how that um, transpires but addressing the issue of antimicrobial resistance is a ma needs to be high on the agenda mm. going into the next mandate as well. That's putting it very very mildly there I yes, saw Indrius sure. is, is fuming industry is furious this week with these proposals. Yeah, well, you know, every time the, that you have a big change in a huge industry like this is, of course, you're going to have a lot of people unhappy. But uh, going back to, to this topic, the, em the emergency topic in the, uh, the lack of uh, pharma pharmaceuticals, in, uh, uh, I proposed last year that we have an emergency storage. Uh, Europe-wide emergency storage and this could address also the price problem because if we buy in a huge amount and when I say we I mean the European Union then we can regulate that we can negotiate that and also we will have an emergency storage to tap into whenever we have this kind of surges which uh, from 100% to 500% you cannot predict that but you can be prepared for something like that and I think this could be an option we could have this on the table. I'm going to stop you there and let's bring in the view from industry because our Paul Lahoc Opano had the opportunity to speak to Alexander Natz. He's the head of the European Confederation of Pharmaceutical Entrepreneurs and he asked him if it was fair to say that industry sometimes put profit before people. Take a listen. To be honest, I don't think any pharma company is, is doing that. Actually, we have an obligation from the regulatory level to have a positive uh, risk-benefit ratio for medicines. So it's really important that uh, that risk-benefit ratio always stays positive. Otherwise, products get withdrawn by the European Medicines Agency, by the European Commission. And I don't think uh, that is really something companies do here in Europe. Let's not forget that any of the prices which, uh, the, of the medicines which, which we bring to European markets are actually negotiated at the national level with respect and other healthcare systems. This is not a price which the company would only set forward, but it's something which is usually negotiated in the EU countries. There you go, Alexander Nats there. Adrian, a reaction to that? 
Yeah, well, I think actually Alexander is right. So the prices of medicines in Europe, with the exception maybe uh, of one or two countries, maybe the UK or something, they are set by the government. So there's a price negotiation. I think what the commission is trying to do is uh, strengthen the negotiating power of some member states that maybe are less wealthy or that are very, very small and therefore don't have a, a strong negotiating position. That's part of the intention behind the legislation. That said, I think another piece that's missing in this legislation is once it is adopted, the member states, your colleagues in, in the government in Bucharest or other places, they're going to have to implement this in practice and, and find those pricing solutions, for example. Um, and, and I think that is something that should be organized. So that doesn't mean that the Commission takes over everything from the national governments, but there should be a clear process of how the national governments are going to implement this. So in the end, patients get the medicines they need. That's what everybody, so that was pointing out, uh, you were pointing out, pharmaceutical industry, the governments, the patient associations, everybody agrees that the ultimate aim of medicines is to get them to a sick patient mm -hmm. and to help them. Um, and so we need this part of the legislation. How we translate this into national settings, I think, is very, very important. And the irony now, some patients don't have access to the medicines, even though they could be produced in their home country or utensils that they need, like an auto injector that they need to use to, to inject their adrenaline, even though they're made. I mean, it seems completely ridiculous. Yeah, definitely. And I think we can address the price problem by looking at the big part of, uh, of the price, which is R&D. So it's natural that the companies need to offset the research and development price, which is higher and higher now as we get more uh, complicated into, into running things. But I think this is where we can help. Because, okay, we're not regulating prices, maybe, or we're regulating them in, in the way that you described, but we can, and I think we must help as the European Union in the R&D part, because we're also looking at America, we're also looking at China as competitors, and we saw what's, what happened during the, the pandemic, who had the best R&D uh, facilities, they were actually the best in the world. So I think we need to invest in that and the pharma companies need to be our partners in that so that Europe keeps the competitive advance in this, uh, in this field and so we get the prices lowered. Reaction there, Daniel? Yeah, for sure, completely agree. And I think research and innovation, research and development is somewhere where Europe can play a strong role. When we go into the conversations about pricing, it always gets a little bit more tricky given the competencies with health and where that these conversations tend to happen more at the member state level. But definitely in terms of R&D, R&I, EU can play a strong role. Now we're almost out of time on this topic, but I also want to just draw your attention to the amount of money spent on lobbying by the pharma industry as well. Um, in this town, we were looking at some figures by Corporate Europe Observatory and they said that the pharma sector is spending about 36 million euros trying to, to put influence and there's about 290 pharma lobbyists based in, uh, in Brussels. What would your reaction be to that? Is that is that fair? Well, I wish that our association had that kind of budget uh, so that I could hire many more staff. Um, look, I don't know if those figures are correct. Of course, um, this is a big industry and there are a lot of uh, big companies that uh, have a lot at stake. So they're going to invest in their representation towards the EU. Um, so I don't know if those figures are correct. I, what I do believe is that I think the pharmaceutical industry, I hope the pharmaceutical industry is engaging in these processes with an ethical perspective. And the ethical perspective is we have to put public health first. Um, and, and I do believe even my competitors on the other side of the industry are, are looking at that, even if we don't agree on a lot of policies. And you as an MEP, have you been lobbied on this file? Well, listen, I'm, I'm definitely not a big fan of uh, lobbying budgets. I think they can put that money to better use. And in order to lobby me, which means talk to me and uh, make me hear their arguments, they only need an email. So I'm an email away or a phone call away from anyone who wants to talk to me. So that's why, again, I'm, I think we can live without these uh, lobbying budgets. Again, if someone wants to talk to us, we are here in Brussels or in Strasbourg. I think most of the MEP's doors are open to anyone. So, and Just briefly, Danielle, did you see the posters around the city? Yeah, I think you'll be dead not to recognise them. They were everywhere. Um, and I think as well, with the, there was a delay in January with this file, and a lot of people thought that the influence that the strong lobby had at the pharmaceutical industry was going to really make massive changes to a leaked version that I think most people saw earlier on. 
but it was quite welcoming to actually see yesterday that there were some changes, but they perhaps weren't as big or as, as groundbreaking as we would have thought. So while their lobbying is still there, I think the Commission did to a certain degree, not completely, but held firm. So Okay, positive. fascinating conversation. Thank you so much to you all for your insights. We will come back to it as we follow those negotiations and keep you well informed. But don't go anywhere, because after the break, we'll be looking into artificial intelligence and the role that can play in healthcare. See you soon here on Euronews and Euronews.com. Welcome back to Brussels, my love, Euronews' weekly talk show that zooms in on some of the European stories in the spotlight this week. I'm Maeve McMahon. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, this week, the European Parliament was set to vote on the EU Commission's strategy on artificial intelligence, but then decided to postpone that vote. To find out more about what exactly is in this proposal, our Paul Lachok Opano checked in with the EU spokesperson, Johannes Bark, to get the gist of their plans for AI. So we're going to be excellent in AI because we have excellent researchers, but we want people to trust AI because many people have concerns. And, you know, if there are concerns, then people will not use the technology. That's why we focus on, let's say, cases where we need to focus on, on high-risk cases. So every, all the time when there is, uh, let's say, fundamental freedoms, you know, an issue for fundamental freedoms or for security, for safety, then uh, this is a high-risk case. So a self-driving car can be a high-risk case or the use of AI, for example, for police, for law enforcement, for employment, you know. So the idea is really to find the balance between regulated cases where it's important and allow innovation to thrive for the majority of AI applications. Johannes Bark there on that constant phrase we keep hearing about finding the balance. Let's hear first from our MEP around the table. Why was that vote delayed? Can lawmakers just not keep up with the speed of AI? I think that's exactly it. And I think we simply need to keep up. I think it's it's about speed. It's not the first time when we are last at the party. And, you know, it's not a good thing to be the last one at the party. Uh, the, we're talking serious now. The Americans are first. Uh, we You don't hear about the European but everything is so the american chat famous chat gpt is american made in america now the chinese have launched their own i don't hear anything about the european version we're constantly thinking about legislation yes legislation is good and of course we need to keep control of it but the industry is much faster than it seems the bureaucracy is and we need to learn from this come on people okay let's let the chat gpt of europe let let it come out any tips then for lawmakers on this area? Well, I, I don't know how to regulate the IT sector, but certainly for the users of IT, like our sector, the pharmaceutical sector, we are actually experimenting with the use of uh, AI, for example, for shortage prevention. So, for example, 9 out of 10 medicine shortages in Europe are in a single country, not across Europe. And so we have this, this data on each box of medicine, so you can, you can basically see where the boxes are going. And we want to use that data to then predict, oh, there's going to be a shortage in Romania or there's going to be a shortage in, in France. And then we can divert the stock to where it's needed. Um, but it's true. We actually are confronted with opposition to this from the regulators. There's no patient data. It's just boxes. Um, but we still get opposition to, to doing this, which, which I find is absurd because it's really a social need. Um, and it's a technology that we are almost certain is going to work. And can play a fascinating role in our futures, in our healthcare. I mean, what would be your take on all this? Well, I think, first of all, AI off offers amazing potentials, particularly in health. And I think health is one of those sectors where you can really see the potential benefits of it. And um, while there might be some risks, I think the benefits outweigh them. And um, so in, even in terms of diagnostics as well, and an issue that we're confronted with in healthcare systems across Europe is healthcare workforce shortages. And actually AI can play a role in even reducing administrative burdens there. So that's also very important. Um, in terms of regulation, I think we're struggling to keep up um, and we really need to push ahead and make sure that even though science is uh, moving very, very quickly, that we also move and try and keep up with it. And we saw Elon Musk, it, he looks pretty spooked recently, even though he's also investing in AI, but he has warned that development in AI should be, should be halted. And he said in an interview earlier this week that it's more dangerous than mismanaged aircraft design or production maintenance or bad car production. And he said that it actually has the potential of civilization destruction. I mean, with these comments, is he not just creating more fear about, around AI? Well, I wouldn't go into the Terminator movie scenario, you know, because this is what it looks like. Of course, it has downsides and those are obvious, but come on, let's... Okay, if we want to keep it in a sandbox, 
let's do that and let's use it in a sandbox but let's build the sandbox already maybe we should use ai to legislate faster i don't know but well, we need to do something is it true are doctors i mean is this ethical are doctors already using chat gbt to prescribe um, medicines for their patients or write sick notes for patients employees i mean would you agree with something like this uh, that I don't know. I would already like to see uh, electronic prescribing uh, used all over Europe because I don't know if you're a patient, for example, it's much easier when you go uh, to the pharmacy. It's also much easier for the governments who are reimbursing this that they don't get ripped off somehow. Um, so, so yeah, I'd like to see those incremental steps already move forward. I don't think that uh, artificial intelligence is going to replace the need for human doctors. That I do not believe. It may facilitate their work and improve their productivity, which uh, I think is necessary today where we have a shortage of, of healthcare practitioners. But I, I, I genuinely do not believe that anywhere in the near future, even the medium term, we're going to replace humans. Uh, it's going to rather help them in their diagnosis. So a bit of reassurance there for any doctors that are tuning in to this show today. Um, Danielle Brady, what would be perhaps your message to those who are afraid, though, of AI? I think um, information and understanding is key um, when combating fear um, and lack of trust. And I think we really need to make sure that we are very transparent with citizens, that they understand what is, is going on. And it can be quite difficult when it's really complex things. But we need to trans be transparent, try to broker that understanding among citizens as well in trying to combat that fear. And then meanwhile, in the European Parliament, we'll see when that vote takes place. Yeah, I... I can't, I'm waiting for it to, to it as you are because again uh, we're we're last on it and again there are some challenges there are some issues but we need this tool it's like any other tool you can use it to do good you can use it to do bad we need to regulate this but okay come on people let's do it faster because again the Chinese are ahead of us they're using it for not that good purposes, they're using it military, and we need to have our own tools. We cannot afford to be again third on this in this race. Do you think we're up for that challenge here in Europe, Adrian? Look, I actually think that Europe has the capability. I think we do need to have a discussion, and probably more the IT experts. I'm certainly not the one about um, you know a framework that's enabling while also dealing with certain risks. I mean, obviously, you know, as pharmaceutical industry, one of the biggest risks we face is cybersecurity because of cybersecurity attacks on pharmaceutical companies, on healthcare institutions like hospitals and things like this. So that's not part of AI, but it's part of the, the challenge with intellectual uh, information technology. So we have to deal with those kind of risks, but that doesn't mean we stop using information technology, right? Because it's so important for productivity, for improvements in quality, for drug development. We use it for drug development. Um, you know, we can't stop using this or we go backward, uh, you know, 50 years or something. OK, going to stop you there. Thank you so much to you all for your insights. And thank you so much for watching. We'll see you soon here on Euronews and Euronews.com. Welcome back to Brussels, my love. Euronews' weekly talk show about the week that was. Well, this week marked 10 years since the Rana Plaza tragedy in Bangladesh when over 1,000 factory workers died in just a few seconds. Now, here in the city centre of Brussels, large balls of clothes were piled up to highlight the destructive impact of fast fashion. And while I was walking outside the European Parliament this week, a similar demonstration caught my eye. Take a look. We're out here protesting outside the EU Parliament because we want them to take action on living wages for the people who make our clothes. We know that most people who make our clothes earn so little that they are trapped in poverty. Despite working really gruelling hours, they cannot afford to send their children to school, live in decent housing, access health care. And so we're saying that enough is enough and it's time for the EU to bring in some really vital legislation um, on living wages for garment workers worldwide. Kira, Kira Barry there from Fashion Revolution telling me the other day that it was fa Fair Fashion Day to raise awareness really among MEPs about the working conditions of workers making the majority of our clothes. Reaction there, Danielle? I um, completely agree. The conditions in a lot of these places where our clothes are being made are, are terrible and um, workers are subjected to below uh, standard working conditions and something needs to be done to, ad to address this. Um, I think fast fashion is a massive, massive problem, not only in terms of, of poverty and conditions that workers face, but also in terms when we look at our planet and sustainability as well. So it's definitely a sector that I think uh, requires attention and I think that can be done at the EU level. 
can it be done? Do you think that the European Parliament and the EU member states have enough power over the, the fashion industry? Well, definitely we can do it, and I will tell you what's our solution. But first, a, f a few figures. 93 billion metri metric cubic, uh, cubic meters of water. This is the way the fashion industry consumes today, and it produces 20% of the waste water in the whole of the world. So... This is the environmental impact of this industry. And the solution, my colleague Valérie Ayer proposed legislation for a tax that could um, in induce producers to produce in an environmental and social fair way. And do you think that people think about those figures when they go shopping? I don't know if people think about it when they go shopping. I think it's increasingly today consumers are what you call empowered, so they, they look at these different social or environmental aspects. So I think that's more and more the case. I also think companies are subject to, to stricter environmental, social, and governance uh, rules. And if they don't follow those rules, they won't get loans from banks or financing and things like this. So this is changing, I think, across all industries. Uh, so, so I definitely think we're moving in, in that direction, maybe not uh, fast enough. One concern maybe I would raise is that we have to be careful because fast fashion, maybe we can criticize people for changing their clothes too often or something like that. But you also have maybe young families with babies and things, and they have to change those clothes quite often for uh, baby reasons. Um, and there we want to make sure that, uh, you know, that those little babies, those parents, they have, they can afford those clothes. Because I think there's also an affordability issue that may play in very limited circumstances. But That is a major issue, Danielle, to buy more sustainable clothes where you know the workers has been given a decent wage. It's going to cost more and some people just can't afford it. For sure it's an issue and it's a consideration that has to be taken into account when, when making changes here. But we also can look at, you know, moving towards a more circular economy. Um, okay, if we are buying sustainably at the first hand where a company is treating their workers fair, then that garment, when it is finished use for one person, can be moved around. We're looking at second hand and more sustainable shopping and then in that stage that should bring prices down at different rates as well. So there are solutions, I think, to this. Um, but of course we have to consider that this is something that everyone can, can take part in and, and afford as well. And meanwhile, there's a big fight in the European Parliament now about whether or not this is even a priority to be debating on these issues when there's a war in Europe. That's why the Conservatives, I believe, have been putting their foot down and they don't want to see progress on this file. But I'm afraid we've run out of time on that topic. It's a topic we will definitely come back to. There's a lot to talk about there. But thank you so much to our panellists for being with us. And thank you so much for watching. If you want to reach out to us here at Brussels, my love, you can write to us on our email address, brusselsmylove at euronews.com. You can also find us on social media. We're on Twitter and Instagram and all the social media sites. So see you soon as well there. Or of course here on Euronews and euronews.com.